Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined again today by Jason Furman, uh, who, with whom we had an I think, excellent conversation about seven months ago on the economy that stands up well. Um, Jason uh, uh, was chair of the Council of Economic Advisors under for President Obama's, I think, almost entire second term. I think you were there for all eight years of the Obama administration. Got us out of the 2008 crisis, laid the groundwork for a strong economy, which then benefited President Trump. So thanks a lot for that. That was that was really a, a good, no good deed goes unpunished, you know. So anyway, and now, to, and more importantly than all this is now the now teaches Act 10, the famous introductory economic course at Harvard. So Jason, thanks for thanks for joining me again. Thanks for having me. I had a lot of fun last time, so I was was happy to come back. Great. Okay. Well, I, we'll have fun or at least be enlightening and instructive. Um, so I mean, we, we really focused last time on inflation. I think you were worried that it wouldn't come down fast enough to let the Fed ease further and that it might just stay higher than we would like. So where are, where sort of have we been and where are we just on on the true true inflation, so to speak, the true rate of inflation? Then we can talk a little bit of the, the political psychology of inflation. Yeah. So inflation has come down much more than I expected. There's still some reasons to be nervous, but before I get to the reasons to be nervous, uh, let's talk about the the reasons to feel good about it. Um, In terms of, first of all, underlying inflation, the best prediction about what's going to happen in the future, um, over the last 12 months, it's been 3.9%. But 12 months is a long time. Most of the inflation in that actually happened a long time ago. Over the last three months, at an annual rate, it's been 3%. Over the last uh, one month, it's been 1.8% um, at an annual rate. So the shorter your time window, the slower inflation is when you take out um, food and energy. And that, to an economist, says, you know, inflation is in the process of slowing. And, you know, that's a really nice thing. Now you look at what families are actually paying, and there has been an uptick lately. We are seeing gasoline prices rise. Um, But for a while, their gasoline prices were falling, which were really salient. And headline inflation was actually doing a bit better um, than underlying core inflation. And all of this has happened with the unemployment rate um, staying low. Yeah, that is pretty remarkable. I don't think anyone expected that unemployment wouldn't have to tick up some to get inflation down to three or below three. I mean, I think you you put some stress on 3% as kind of the... The number which below which the Fed would be comfortable not raising rates again. Am I right about that, or that it would sort of? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Fed chair is very clear that he does not want to change the inflation target. My view is, if we get which to is two point, two, which is two percent, um, my guess they're not clear about this, and for good reason they're not clear about this. My guess is, if inflation settled in at say two point eight, two point nine, they'd say we'd like it to be two, but. We're willing to be patient and wait. And by the way, they also have a dual mandate. They're supposed to focus on inflation and they're supposed to focus on unemployment. Um, when inflation is 5 6%, the dual mandate really is about inflation. It's just about getting inflation down. Once inflation is in the twos, I think they can say, you know what? You know, We'd like to be at two, but we're not going to cause a recession to get there. Um, I think it's still a bit of an open question as to whether... We are going, we're sort of trending towards a bit above three or a bit below three. And part of that depends on, you know, a year ago, inflation looked bad in part because there was underlying inflation. And in part, there was a bunch of bad luck. The Russian invasion of Ukraine had nothing to do with American economic policy. It really did add a big bunch of inflation on top of what we already would have had. Um, Over the last six months, we've gotten some good luck in terms of various things breaking in the right way for inflation. And so, you know, I'm not sure that that good luck all continues. If it goes away, if you end up in a world where inflation is a bit above three and the Fed needs to come back and fight it, um, I think that's a real possibility. Um, but the soft landing is, you know, much, much more possible than it's it's been for this whole episode. And to just look forward for a minute before we kind of get to the psychology question, which you and I are both, I think, quite interested in. I mean, so all things considered, with all the caveats about how difficult it is to prognosticate, there could be more unanticipated events, like, God forbid, invasions of Ukraine, but whatever, you know, things that we we don't expect. You're sort of thinking three-ish inflation for the next X months and 
kind of current interest rates or slightly declining interest rates in terms of what would affect you know consumers, car loans, uh, mortgages, and so forth. I mean, right. So the Fed funds rate is easy. Maybe they raise one more time. Maybe they don't raise. It's not going to be that different from where it is now. The harder thing is that the long-term interest rate, the 10-year treasury, and that's what's most closely linked to mortgages, car loans, the thing that matters for families, that's risen a lot just in the last month for reasons that no one can quite get to the bottom of. Um, Sometimes rates go up when people think there's going to be a lot of inflation in the future, but that isn't happening now. Inflation forecasts have not risen. Um, There's just more of a general nervousness that's showing up in interest rates. Some of it may be related to the government budget deficit. Budget deficits are quite high and they drive up interest rates. And so I don't think the Fed is going to be trying to sort of create the same problems it's tried to create in the past to slow the economy. But financial markets have taken on a bit of a life of their own. And I'm not quite sure why, so I'm not quite sure whether that'll continue or not. But looking at, so it's October 3rd, I think we're speaking, 2023. If we were October 3rd, 2024, people will be voting. So just to be a little more political, I mean, you think most likely kind of not radically different situation in terms of uh, inflation, interest rates, or unemployment from today? Is that the, was that the average prediction, so to speak, or the mean or the median or whatever those? Whatever. Right. I mean, there's a long track record of if in economics you predict that whatever happened last year will happen next year. That's not a great forecast, but it's better than all the other forecasts. Um, And that's roughly where I'd be right now. Sometimes you can try to see some special factor that's going to push things um, one way or another. But yeah, I don't see, you know, recessions. The best model for them is you roll a die. And if it's a one, you get a recession. If it's a two through six, you don't. People have always come up with different models to predict recessions, and there have been some fantastic models at predicting recessions in the past, Um, but when you try to use them for the future, they tend to break down. Um, And so, yeah, I look around, and there's things to be nervous about and commercial real estate and stuff like that, but there's a lot to be positive about, too. Real earnings have actually been rising a lot lately. People's um, wages have been growing faster than inflation, that does give a certain momentum to consumer spending um, in the economy. And consumers are both very unhappy and spending a lot, right? Exactly. There's a real difference between, you know, when you survey people about their mood about the economy, especially if they get an inkling that you're thinking of it politically and not just economically, and then how they vote with their wallets. Um, Why didn't we have a recession last year when the Fed was doing this historic, incredibly rapid rate increase? It was the American consumer. Um, The Fed did do what it was trying to do, and it creamed the housing sector. Home building declined by more than it had declined since the financial crisis. Normally, that would lead to a recession, but American consumers were just spending like crazy. Um, In the first half of this year, American consumers were spending quite a lot. Um, the tracking so far for the third quarter of this year, which just ended, um, suggests that consumers spent a lot in that quarter too. And it's just hard to have a recession when people are just so optimistic with their wallets. Are they optimistic or could they be, I've read this a couple of places, uh, internalizing some inflation expectations and spending now to beat price hikes later? Uh, someone I read some cart of whatever this is worth, one anecdote, an auto dealer saying that uh, she, I think it was a she, was talking with her customers and some of them wanted to get their car now because they thought the price would be considerably higher, you know, next year. You know, if you consumer expectations for inflation over the next year, they survey them on that question. Um, and that's come down a decent amount. It's still a bit higher than normal, but it's not much higher than normal. So people don't seem to be expecting um predicting that there will be a lot of inflation. They're complaining a lot uh, about the inflation that already happened, and, and, and we're going to get to that. But I don't know. I mean, for a while, I thought it was you gave people so much money in 2020 and 2021. You locked people at home for a year where they weren't spending as much as normal, and that gave people the sort of extra war chest that when the economy reopened, um, they were spending. Um, 
that theory implied that it would stop at some point. And people sometimes call that the excess savings that household has. And you know, there's different ways to measure it. Maybe households still have some. But um, you know, at this point, it's a little bit more self-sustaining. It's a little bit more gas prices came down. Even with the recent increases, they're still down over the last year. And so that gives you a little bit more room to, to spend on other things. So you think we're mostly through the kind of extraordinary COVID cash payments, accumulating household balance, household balance sheets looking better and better, I guess, uh, then spending that down once we get liberated post COVID. Is that sort of mostly done, so to speak? I mean, yeah, I, I think at this point, I almost try not to think about COVID just personally for a lot of reasons, but you know, we're sort of not that different from we where we would be if we had never gone through COVID and never gone through the policy response. You gave someone data for 2019 and then data for 2023, and they wouldn't necessarily infer something big had happened between, except that the price level um, is much higher um, than it was. Um, and consumers are, you know, if you want to get yourself nervous, they actually are borrowing more. Interest rates are going up. Delinquencies are going up. Those are all sort of roughly where they were pre-COVID. But the trend line is in the wrong direction on those things. So maybe people are stretching themselves, not to a point that makes me nervous right now, but I extrapolate forward and ask where they are a year from now. Um, you know, maybe at some point consumers will will have uh, fewer resources. You had a very important caveat in there that, uh, except for the price level, so maybe let's just turn to that, because if you asked, certainly the polling shows, people sort of... Uh, as you say, it's 2019 in terms of unemployment and in terms of perhaps, well, we'll get to real income, but people think they sort of internalize the notion that, of course, it was always going to be as good as it was in 2019 after, you know, eight years of without a recession, but really, right, nine years, I guess, pretty much. Um, but uh, but the one thing they do notice is the price level is considerably higher and there's no deflation, even if it's not going up as fast. So, I mean, so that's a big, a big difference, right? I mean, it's, uh, yeah. and it certainly has real political impact. So talk a little bit about that. You've also looked at some of the, you know, uh, both consumer surveys, but also public opinion surveys on that. And why, why does inflation seem to have such a, uh, or not just inflation, but the, the actual rise in the price level, just to say, seems to just be very much on people's minds. Yeah. So in 1997, the Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller did a survey and he surveyed normal people and he surveyed economists. And the question that they had the biggest difference on was if prices, he asked them, go up 20% because the government messed up, should the government make the prices go back down again? Or should we just accept that and have them be 20% higher forever? 92% of economists said, you know what, if that happens, they should be higher forever. 10% of the public agreed. And 10%, you know, 90% of the public wanted them basically to lower those prices right back down to where they were. Um, now, if you frame the question and as, would you like everything in the supermarket to be where it is now, or would you like it all to be 20% cheaper? It's not a surprise that people would answer that way. Um, the reason that economists, I think correctly, uh, had the reason they said is that's not how it works. If you want to get prices down by 20%, you also need to lower wages by 20%. And you're probably not going to be able to do either of those things without having a massive recession. And so if the poll question was, do you want a massive recession that lowers prices and wages by 20%, you know, I think that 92% of the people would be with the economists. Um, yeah, if the uh, managing deflation is not the easiest thing probably to do, right. so you don't want to right. run that experiment, um, right? right? But if you don't have that mental model, you know, most people got larger raises than average over the last couple of years. But they may think they deserve those raises. They worked harder, they switched jobs, and not realize that, no, we're in an environment where everyone was getting a larger raise and it never, ever would have happened that way if it wasn't for prices going up. Businesses just couldn't afford to pay as much more um, as they have. So I really do think um, this price level, and, and you can, you know, I see it myself. If milk goes from $3 to $3.06, I'm not going to notice. If it goes from $3 to $4, I'm going to notice. If then it goes from $4 to $4.08, the Fed's going to say, hey, we're at 2% inflation. Isn't it great? And I'm going to be like, what the hell? Four was expensive, and now it's even more. And so I think this, this combination of price level, 
plus money illusion where you think prices are something that was done to you by Joe Biden, by Jay Powell, by Mitch McConnell, you know, whoever it is, there's some, you know, evil corporate CEOs, there's some villain that did the price thing to you. And then you think the wage thing you deserved and you don't see any link between those two, then it's not surprising people would feel this way. And what is the true truth about, so far as we, there is one or several, maybe there are a range of true truths about how much the wage level has gone up compared to how much prices have gone up? Because you see different things some places. It's lagged, it's not, purchasing power isn't quite at 100 if 100 were 2019. No, it's actually now resumed its upward path that I think it did have, didn't it, for much of the last half of the 2010s where wages were increasing faster than prices. So what is definitely true is that from around April 2021 through the beginning of 2023, wages were rising less than inflation, so people were falling behind. This year, wages have been outpacing inflation, so people are getting ahead. If you look at the whole thing, people are now ahead of where they were in, prior to COVID. So wages have increased more than prices prior to COVID. Where it gets tricky is, is the pace of increase sort of what people were used to? less of an increase in real wages than they were used to or more than it. And depending on which data source and how you measure it, um, you could argue that real wages are ahead of trend, at trend. I think probably they're a bit below trend, which is to say, yes, people's wages have outpaced inflation, but they were outplacing it by even more um, in the couple of years before COVID. And, you know, so there's a reason to be a little bit disappointed about where we are. But you know, it, this is one where it depends a lot on what data you pick. But unambiguously, wages have risen more than prices. Wow. And that's true kind of across income classes, so to speak, uh, upper, middle, middle, working class? It's more, for the very highest income, sort of the top 10%, um, that's actually probably not true. Um, they've probably seen larger price increases than wage increases. For most other income groups, um, they've seen faster wage growth than price growth. So when you see one of these polls that I just saw, one seventy-five percent of the public believe their incomes are falling behind cost of living. They're they're not wrong to worry about cost of living, but but they're wrong actually that their incomes. I mean, not all of them are wrong because if the average is the average, forty percent of them are falling behind, or thirty percent, or something, right? But but seventy-five percent, not all that seventy-five percent are correct that they're falling behind. Probably, yeah, yeah, I think. And, and what's interesting is normally, like when people do these, um, you know, political scientists mostly and some economists do these election forecasting models based on the economy, those models never have, are you better off than you were four years ago? They don't do the Reagan question. The thing that predicts elections is what's happened to you over the last year. And over the last year, the trend in wages and prices is an unambiguously good. Um, wages have definitely increased more than prices um, over the last year. And so normally that's what matters politically. But even as things have gotten either better or great or less bad, but whatever it is, at the very least, things are less bad now than they were a year ago, people in answering surveys don't seem to feel or express that sentiment. And yeah, that's either puzzling or it's this money illusion plus price level. Well, or, I mean, what about this, that, you know, if you have a steady state, whether you have very low interest rates as we did for over a decade or medium interest rates as we did maybe prior to that, and you're kind of gradually outperforming those those rates of cost of, uh, which presumably translates to inflation, so the, the inflation rates, I should say, not interest rates, um, uh, and you, you know, you're slightly outperforming inflation year over year, okay, you sort of adjust to, you, you kind of internalize that. I wonder how much of it is people who've lived in a non-inflationary environment, zero interest rate environment, basically for the decade, right? I mean, suddenly seeing, what is it all in? About 20%, 18% hike in price level, I think, compared to 2019, yeah. or maybe compared to January 1st, 2021, I think. And it's sort of, that's a different thing to, you can, what, it may, it's presumably true that you may have gotten 21% of wage increases and the wage and the price levels up 19%, but that's a different thing psychologically than, you know, trending, 
inflation trending at two percent and wage increases trending at two and a half. Don't you think? I, I think the suddenness of it is sort yeah. of a, a psychological shock. Yeah, and you know, look when Volcker tackled inflation, he only brought it down to something like three and a half, but it had been building up for fifteen or twenty years. And so I think people rightly understood, wow, you know, we've just gotten through this thing. Here, it just came from nowhere. People under the age of 50 basically had no experience with anything like this. And so I think it was much more shocking. And conversely, I think getting rid of it is sort of at a bare minimum, of course, you get rid of inflation. You know, you know, this this thing came from nowhere. We haven't had it in our whole lives. So I think there's... It's less of an impressive feat than tackling such a long-term entrenched inflation. And the other thing is you brought up mortgage rates. There's a lot of people, whether they're working in financial markets or they just borrow money to buy a house, who just have never experienced high interest rates. I talk to people older than me and you know they tell you with nostalgia about like how thrilled they were when they got that 12% mortgage you know, decades ago. Um, you know, that's just not what people have been used to for a while now. And it's certainly not back anywhere close to 12%. But, you know, it's a lot higher than it was a couple of years ago. I mean, I think your point about people, and you said people under 50, that's really a large number of people never really having experienced this and sort of freaking out a little. Therefore, if they see price levels up 20% from not 20 years ago, everyone knows that we're not going back to the price levels of whatever, you know, 50 years ago. And they're all, but, but just, just 2021, not or 2020, right? Not not that, or certainly 2019. So, um, I think the degree of that people, that's not quite captured by the uh, the pure numbers. I think, and 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 uh, it's not crazy for people to then think, gee, if this happened sort of when no one was looking, as it were, over the last two, three, four years, and people were pursuing presumably reasonable economic policies. How do we know it won't happen again? I mean, I think in right. that respect, you know, it's right. It's 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 lower now than it was. A year ago by quite a lot, but it's not, as you say, in a way people would sort of almost are, are fully reassured that it's continuing, will continue to trend lower. Yeah. And I, you know, one's tempted to dismiss public opinion as like it's all partisan and they've all been ginned up by Fox. And there's no question that American public opinion is much more polarized than it used to be. If you do surveys, is the economy good? The people that think it's good completely reversed between. October 2020 and December 2020, the Democrats all of a sudden thought it was good and the Republicans thought it was bad. That does have a ceiling. There's a hardcore, I don't know if it's 35% of Americans, who we could have nirvana. And if Biden was president, it would still be awful. Um, and if Trump was president, a different 35% would would think it was, was awful. So I think there's some of that. But I think you do want to try to listen sympathetically to the fact that it's not all bad faith. If people go to the supermarket and they're surprised by prices, I don't think that's just ginned up by Fox News. I think a lot of people do feel that um, sincerely. And so I think especially if you're in the political system, um, you, you just can't afford to just dismiss people's concerns as irrational and politically motivated. You have to try to listen to the people who have those concerns in good faith and figure out you know, how to connect with them. I mean, one friend of mine made a point to me the other day, which I'm curious to get your reaction to, which is, okay, the supermarket, that's one thing. That's that's particularly, presumably, middle to lower middle class, working class people who really are careful. I mean, I don't mean to general, overgeneralize, but it, it, you and I see what the prices are too. But but people, you know, who really are, page, as they say, paycheck to paycheck and really, you know, are cutting back on one thing because the supermarket prices are higher than they would otherwise be. But I think you add to that the interest rate driven phenomena, which is, I guess, mostly what autos and houses for housing for people, you know, in, in, in sort of middle, upper middle class world. And those rates, I mean, the Fed, I assume, did the right thing basically by raising interest rates as much as they did. Uh, as you say, it's kind of been a soft landing. But on the other hand, the, in the real world, if you are thinking of, you know, your family is growing and you're thinking of moving and you're going to buy a house today when you bought one on a fixed mortgage five years ago, the act say so you don't get a nicer house the same the same cost. I mean the actual payments are double. I think right. I mean by definition, if interest rates have more than doubled, probably the payments are close to double. Uh, uh, and uh, that could be a pretty you know thousand bucks extra on your mortgage a month, or the car a few hundred bucks extra on your car payment. 
uh, suddenly you're, you know, that plus the annoyance of the supermarket uh, experience that can make you, that could be unnerving, I guess I would say, if we're, you know, to be sympathetic to the people and assuming they're not just snowflakes who are complaining too much or brainwashed by Fox News, you know? Yeah. And that's why I think, you, again, I'm not an expert in how exactly to communicate with people, but if I were in the White House, I'd be saying there are still real difficulties and real challenges that people are facing. Yes, a lot of things have gotten better. Yes, there's a lot we can brag about. But, you know, here are the legitimate concerns people have, or here are some of the concerns, um, you know, that might be understandable. Look, on, on the mortgages, I a reporter called me to interview me for a story on just this topic. Why are people upset with the economy? And then the reporter started talking about their own experience. They just had another child, I think. They wanted to move to a larger house, but they had a low mortgage rate locked in on their current house, and they didn't want to move. And so they're stuck in the wrong house, a choice between having the wrong house for their family or paying a lot more for their monthly mortgage. Um, that person was sort of unhappy about it. Um, moreover, if you looked at the data, you wouldn't see the source of their unhappiness because their mortgage payments haven't gone up. The data doesn't record that they wanted to move and didn't. It just records how much they're paying for their mortgage, which is a fixed rate and you know pretty low. So you know, there's, there's a lot of stories out there. Now, that's such an interesting point, though, about the data not capturing the psych, the, I guess, if you want to keep talking, uh, economists talk, in a way, it's a certain kind of opportunity cost, you might say, of a uh, foregone chance to improve your living situation uh, because of interest rates being so much higher, right? And and that, but that isn't captured, that you didn't make that move, and you're still living in a nice enough house, presumably, you're not, you know, it's not the Great Depression, but uh, I think that is... Striking. I mean, James Carville, I think it was Car some political person, I think it was James, made this point to me, um, a similar point about sh about the groceries. Just, I mean, it's not just, and, and going out to a restaurant and, and paying a lot more, it's not just the price, you know, yes, you're paying $82 for your meal for three or four or something at Olive Garden, not, you know, not $62 or $72. Uh, but it's then you, gee, when your kid says, hey, can we go out and get pizza tonight? You say, well, yeah, that's, that's good. But then you sort of think to yourself, does that mean we probably can't go to something else this weekend we were hoping to do? Or you don't, you know, will we have enough to do the vacation that we were hoping to do with the family in the summer? I think the psychological cost of the price increases in terms of people having to think about it a lot, whatever the merits and demerits of like not having inflation, basically, and sort of a zero interest rate regime, it was, presumably it was unsustainable, but it sort of took a lot off your mind. You know, you didn't really have to with the slight exception of gas prices, which seem to go up and down a lot, people were kind of, you were able to live your life sort of without a lot of psychological burden in this respect. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's true. Um, but, you know, again, these families are getting paid. A, yeah. No, I, I mean, know. it varies a lot. It varies a lot. You know, some people, you know, I, I'm just telling you the averages, there's all sorts of variation. But, you know, there weren't a lot of people getting six, seven, 8% raises at work before, and there's been a lot more of that in, in the last couple of years. So I think you still need some, you know, thinking differently about wages and prices. So yeah, so I think there's a combination of reasons to be concerned, reasons not to be concerned. Most everything's getting better, but that doesn't mean it's great. No, the wage, yeah, why, why people, yeah, people, you think people would, rec people used to be very sensitive to their wage, to their salaries and to their wages. Um, it feels like, yeah, maybe they'll get more sensitive again if they look back a year from now on two or three years of rising wages and say, well, hey, look at this, you know, this is where we were. And we'll have to take a political date, January 20th, 2021, and here's what my paycheck says today. And uh, even, you know, including taxes and other, you know, whatever, it's kind of quite a lot higher, right? I mean, I don't know. You don't hear that a lot these days, but maybe that's just people are in a... People do get a sort of negative mood, honestly, and it's a little hard to disentangle that from what's happening. Yep. <laughs> um, what else should we be looking for in terms of, um, you know, sort of the situation out there? Labor shortage, I think we talked about that some six, seven months ago, and we agreed that it would be nice to have more immigration, and we agreed that wasn't likely to happen politically. I think it sort of happened a little beneath the radar, but where are we on that? I do think people also, of course, labor shortage is good for wages, but people also get annoyed if they, you know, go to a restaurant and the service isn't, you know, isn't great and so forth. Yeah, there's less of a labor shortage. We actually are roughly on track with where you would have expected immigrants to be. I mean, the labor market fits into the category of 
if you didn't know about COVID, just had 2019 data, just had 2023 data, nothing about the number of people working, who's working, number of open jobs looks super surprising. Um, we're still tilted a bit towards um, a high, higher number of job openings than unemployed. That does put some upward pressure on wages. If it's just wages, that's great. If it's wages and prices, um, then you know it's less good. The um, but broadly, the labor market looks you know a bit on the hot tight side, but pretty good. Um, economic growth, GDP growth. We just finished the third quarter. At the end of October, we're going to find out what that growth rate was. The Atlanta Fed, which is one of the main trackers people look at to know this answer is betting on 4.9% growth, for which is just really high. Real now, growth. Real, real growth. growth, real growth. Um, now, I would take the under. That just seems ridiculously high to me, but that it'll be above three seems pretty likely. Um, that's amazing in an economy where you know we had a what many thought was a banking crisis um, back in March to you know two quarters later be you know, posting these just extraordinarily high growth rates. Yeah, speaking of the banking crisis, you never get credit for the disasters you avert, right, in government. That's one of the things that, uh, I mean, I served in the first George H.W. Bush White House. We kind of won the Cold War, helped win the Cold War without the shot almost being fired. Uh, we kind of resolved the SNL crisis, which was a pretty big crisis. I mean, in comparison to 2008, it looks like peanuts, but it was seemed at the time like a big deal. That got pretty well resolved and uh, did the budget deal of 1990. And of course, Bush, uh, Bush's vote from 1988 to 1992 dropped from 54% to 38%. So no good deeds, good deeds go on, no good deed goes unpunished, especially if the good deed is sort of stopping something bad from happening, you know, that, that isn't so visible. But what about the banking crisis? Was it obvious that it was going to be able, well, has it been truly resolved? Or was it obvious that it would be resolved so well, apparently? Yeah, I think we're out of it. Huh. The banks that went under were really quite extreme in terms of things like a concentrated uninsured depositor base or making having a set of assets on this, their balance sheet that were really, really sort of very safe in terms of default risk but really risky in terms of interest rate risk, holding long-term government bonds that went down in value. So I think we are out of the woods. And one way to see that is for a while I was checking every week. Now I tune in sort of every couple of weeks to what happened to bank deposits. And you saw them going down. Bank deposits are going back up again. And as long as people keep their money in the banks, the banks are fine. Um, the issue is if there's an old-fashioned bank run where everyone takes their deposits out and forces a problem in the bank. And we're just not seeing those bank runs. We're seeing the stock prices of the regional banks have rebounded quite a lot from where they were um, before the crisis. And I do think the government played a big role in this. Um, you know, They guaranteed the depositors at these banks. You know, That's distasteful and unpleasant. And you know, I would have loved to see all sorts of these people that stuff tons of money in Silicon Valley Bank lose their money. But you know what? As good as it would have felt to watch them lose their money for their bad choices, watching the bank run on 50 other banks and the financial crisis that it would cause and the amount of people that would lose their jobs and pain and suffering, um, you just can't afford to give in to that type of sort of Old Testament notions of uh, of justice at a time like this. And I think the administration rightly guaranteed those banks. They didn't extend a blanket guarantee, but they basically made everyone feel comfortable that they'd be guaranteed elsewhere. That stopped the bank run. And the system as a whole then ended up not needing that help. I mean, that's the beautiful thing is if you promise to do something to help out in a banking situation, it might be really cheap because you might never have to do it as long as people believe you. And I think that's largely what happened here. I mean, should they should they change the FDIC rules somehow to not have this two hundred fifty thousand dollar cap and all that sort of thing? Yeah, I think they should change it and raise the cap, and then also, by the way, make the banks pay for the higher cap. Um, you can't do that in the midst of a thing. You can't have the bank that just had a problem, but it's insurance. You make everyone pay a higher premium. You have a higher cap, and you know this. I, I mean, I've talked to you know if I talk to conservative economists. 
they sort of don't like high taxes and liberal economists like high taxes. There are certain things in economics where your view differs. I went around to every conservative economist I knew and asked them this whole thing about if you insure depositors, will they stop paying attention and you'll get moral hazard and have problems in the banking system? I would say of the 10 conservative economists I went to, nine of them rolled their eyes at the idea that depositors would ever pay attention to what was going on in a bank or be a useful warning sign. Now, one of them did believe that theory, but um, and you read that theory on the Wall Street Journal editorial page. But I think for the most part, yes, if your system is to expect people to get on the airplane they're going to get on and inspect it for safety, um, that system is almost as ludicrous as the idea that you would um, be able to inspect your bank for safety. I think we're better off with the government doing that and giving people insurance. Yeah, I do feel like Janet Yellen has gotten zero credit for that. And she'll probably be like the, the, the sec- maybe she'll be the best treasury secretary who will get the least credit for being a good treasury secretary ever. I don't know, you know. Right. And, and one thing, and I think it's partly to her credit and partly the administration's credit, the banking stuff didn't get super politicized. There's a little bit of a like, retrospective debate. Some Republicans were like, oh, it was the woke regulators' fault. And some Democrats were like, it was the greedy bankers' fault, and, you know, whatever. But the actual guaranteeing the depositors, I thought it might cause, cause a firestorm of here's the bailouts, the rich are just getting richer, blah, blah, blah. And there was a bit of complaining here and there, but not a lot. So I thought actually at both sides of the chamber, you know, people who tend to be a little bit more populist like Sherrod Brown, um, I can't remember the head of the House Banking Committee, um, I think he was reasonably responsible in his approach as well, the Republican head of it. So, you know, I think our his system didn't handle it perfectly, but it handled it with more maturity than we handle a lot of things. Yeah. Let me ask a couple of things you've mentioned in passing as possible problems or uh, commercial real estate. I mean, some people I know go to New York and look at some of the buildings that are half empty and start thinking, oh, my God, what's you know that thing's going to be a big drag on the economy for for years and, and, and really a big problem. And other people I know say, you know, it's a limited number of places and the banks can work it out. And it's, you know, the normal adjustment you would have when you change from a, everyone goes to the office economy to a, you know, go to the office three or four days a week economy. What's the truth in between those two, if there's one? I'm closer to the, um, to the sort of sanguine view. Um, commercial real estate is a large space some things retail a lot of the country is actually doing quite well. People like um, to go to stores for certain um, types of things. You know, developing things like um, urgent care medical facilities are doing super well and will continue likely to do um, super well. You know, student housing is like a whole sector um, in this space too, for example. So the office buildings, I think, are the big problem. And you read a scary story in the Wall Street Journal this is on the news page, not the editorial page. And then you look at the numbers, and the numbers are sort of $400 billion over the next five years. And this is in a banking system that has maybe $2.2 trillion cushion right now. And, you know, I think it's hard to get super worried about it. Um, I think it will be a problem for certain companies. Um, I do think over the next five years, there are some banks that are going to come under stress because their, their deposit business model isn't going to work forever. Their lending business model in this world of interest rates we have now won't work forever. And so there will be more consolidation in the banking sector. Um, banks will need to get creative about their business models, but there's a big difference between a problem that unfolds over six months in a crisis-like fashion and something that you have five years to restructure your way around. So it, it feels much more like that second scenario to me. And deficit and debt, that's something we've all gotten pretty complacent about over the over the last lo- long, long time, honestly. I mean, God, when I think of what the political price George H.W. Bush paid to get the, the, the deficit down from, I can't even remember, 300 uh, billion to 250, or, you know, and then 200. I mean, it was, those are like such tiny numbers now, <laughs> rounding errors kind of in the... Uh, the actual debt and deficit. That, I suppose, is one of the things that COVID would be necessary to know about, to explain that we're running a $2 trillion deficit. Would it be or not? And and how worried should one be? I mean, those numbers, I, I myself had, like everyone else, hadn't been following it much. And suddenly I read that article that we all, I think, saw it was in the Post. I can't remember. It was a pretty good explanation. 
And it's like the actual government is taking in, I'm going to get this wrong somewhat, but you'll know, four and a half trillion dollars a year in revenues and is spending six and a half trillion dollars a year in 2023, which is a good economy and not yeah. in the middle of a, rece- of a depression and not, you know, it's a little bit of Ukraine expenditures, but not much in the big scheme of things. And we're not fighting the Iraq war, let alone, you know, World War II or something. So why are we running such a massive deficit? And what about the accumulated debt? Yeah, I'm getting much more scared by the day. And I don't think COVID is an excuse anymore. Most of those COVID expenditures have dropped away. The deficit was $1 trillion last fiscal year, or actually now two fiscal years ago. Um, and then the fiscal year that just ended a couple of days ago, it looks like it's going to be $2 trillion. And that's in an economy, as you said, with you know, roughly three and a half percent unemployment, a stock market rising, all sorts of things. So that's just an extraordinary increase. Now, there are some volatile things. Inflation actually plays havoc and it moved revenue from one year to another, given the way they do the indexing. Um, that happened with Social Security. That happened with capital gains. So you probably want to think of it as an economy with a run rate of one and a half trillion deficit both of those years, not a skyrocketing deficit. One and a half trillion, that's 6% of GDP. So when you say this is larger than it was under George Bush, it's not just that every number is larger. I don't remember exactly what the deficit was, but I'd be surprised if it was above 3% of GDP um, at any point in time um, under George Bush. And 6% of GDP now. The Wasn't 3% percent the number, sorry to interrupt, like it was used by one of the international organizations to say that- The IMF you know, generally uses that. Yeah, that that's like trouble sign, right? It's the 3% yeah. of, of GDP. Yeah, that's what the IMF's generic rule and is. That, and, and we're we, at six. Yeah, and we actually use that under Obama as sort of our internal guideline. And we're at six right now. Uh, by the way, we're at eight this past year. But as I said, I think some of that was volatile. So I think it's sort of underlying thing is six. Um, our debt's 100% of GDP. And then the last thing is um, you look at interest rates. And the 10-year interest rate is, you know, in the neighborhood or above 4.5% right now. It's two and a half percent just a few years ago. And so I think there's a lot to be worried about. So just now the Treasury is going to have to refinance that debt. Yeah. That could yes. double the interest rate, basically. Exactly. Exactly. And and by the way, the Treasury did not borrow very much long term. Like if it had locked in lots of 30 year debt, we wouldn't be worried. But they borrow, we borrow shorter term in the United States than most other countries do. So a lot of our debt's coming due in the next year or two. Um, now, I think I've lost patience with fiscal crisis forecasts because, you know, if you ask the deficit warriors 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, what would happen if we ever got to 100% debt to GDP, a 6% deficit, they'd say everything would have collapsed. And, you know, I look outside, it's a beautiful sunny day, everything seems roughly intact. Um, So I don't, it's not the fiscal crisis I'm worried about, but this is playing a role in those higher interest rates, those mortgage payments that are difficult for people. It will over time impede um, private investment. And so I think this is more about unnecessarily chipping away at the economy. And then the old hackneyed saying is true, the longer you wait, um, the harder it will be, economically at least, to solve this problem. And it's impeding if you're a fan of government spending, whether it's for defense or for uh, a domestic policy, it's impeding that a lot, right? That plus entitlements. I mean, it is an awful lot, which are difficult to cut and maybe should be difficult to cut. That's a pretty big chunk of the federal budget right now. Yeah. And it's just so impossible to imagine how anyone's going to solve this, that someone would come forward um, like President Bush did and do a bipartisan thing as he did in 1990 that or you know a party line thing as democrats did in 1993 um it's just so hard to understand um where where the pressure will come from now one possibility is part of why there was pressure on bush and clinton back then was that interest rates were quite high and certainly under clinton my guess is it was the same under bush we were telling president clinton hey if you do this thing mortgage rates will go down. Um, And mortgage rates did go down. And he went around bragging about how, I remember I used to help produce some of these numbers, you know, typical families saving $200 a month because of lower mortgage rates. And the Clinton economic plan helped make this happen. Um, And that was all true. What fraction of the help one could debate, but 
that it helped, I think, was true. Um, so maybe we'll get to that point where some politician asks their economic advisor, how do I help people get lower mortgage rates? They tell them this is the only way to do it, and they decide that's a, a politically salient and attractive thing to do. But to do it, you have to either raise taxes or cut spending, not to be too simple-minded about this. I mean, if you actually want to reduce the, the delta between the two, so uh, where's the market? For, I mean, spending seems to be curbed. I mean, these budget deals with sort of deals with Biden and McCarthy are kind of, you know, anticipate flat spending going forward, basically. But I mean, we were trying to reach a grand bargain with Republicans in 2011 around the debt limit, um, Obama and Boehner. There were some people on our economic team that were very worried about the deficit. I think probably too worried about it. That was part of why we were doing it. But part of why we were doing it was our political advisors actually really liked that. And they liked it for two reasons. One, they thought that if Obama did something with the Republicans, that would be much more popular than the things he had done party line on his own in his first two years, like the Affordable Care Act. To be clear, we were very proud of the Affordable Care Act. But no one did the Affordable Care Act as a political strategy to get reelected. They did it because they thought, rightly or wrongly, it was good for the world. Um, but they thought it would be good to do something bipartisan for him politically. And they thought if it helped the economy, that ultimately that would just matter more than anything else um, for his reelect. And so, you know, we thought doing something that included putting Medicare and Social Security on the table with Speaker Boehner, you know, some things you'd think are pretty politically untouchable. Um, we thought that was in our political interest. Um, I don't think anyone quite sees it that way now. Maybe we made a mistake back then. Maybe they're making a mistake now. Maybe the politics have changed. But, you know, something could work out here. But remind me, you were there. You'll know this. I mean, between, let's just say, now and 2011, you know, late 2011 and late 2012, uh, you've gone through whatever you've gone through with Obamacare and the bailouts and uh, the drubbing in the November 2010 election and so forth and the deal sort of of 2011 I guess it was a deal really it wasn't quite the big deal the yep. grand deal that people yep. wanted where were we I mean things were better if I'm not mistaken in terms of unemployment and maybe also interest rates and and stuff by late 2012 than they had been in 2011 it wasn't rising it wasn't recovering as Republicans this is a slow recovery it's a blah but it was a, a genuine economic recovery right Oh, things were moving very strongly in the right direction, and things were still way worse than, you know, what you could reasonably, reasonably expect them, um, you know, to be. In, you know, when, when President Obama ran for re-election, the unemployment rate was still 8%. So it had come down, you know, I mean, it was falling every single month. So every month was better, but it was in a bad place. Um, now, interestingly, real wages were good because we hadn't had much inflation and people were getting okay raises. So if you had a job, you were actually doing fine and you had no problem affording groceries. Um, but there were a lot of people that wanted jobs and didn't have them when he ran for re-election. Yeah. And, he, and of course, he won by a slightly narrower margin than he had won originally in 2008. And so I think he, the general view of the political people I knew was that the economy was good enough to drag him out of it put this in an unpleasant way, but I mean, you know, to, to pull him across the finish line and that yeah. was good, fine for him, but but it wasn't like, it wasn't Reagan 84, obviously, or it didn't feel like Reagan 84. Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't think we'll ever have that because of the partisan right, right. in our country, but uh, but I agree it wasn't. And, and, and But that also gets back to these um, political economy forecasting models we were talking about before. They're much more about what's happened in the last, are you better off than you were a year ago? then are you better off than you were four years ago? That seems to be the way people were voting. And definitely in November 2012, people were a lot better off than they were um, in November 2011. They just weren't obviously better off than they were in, you know, in 2007. Right, but that, that crash happened on Bush's watch, which was good for That, honestly, that probably helped politically, too. Yes. That, I mean, um, I do think... One difference from the UK, where, you know, the Labour Party was there for the crash and there for the slow recovery. And so they didn't have quite the same get out of jail free card um, that uh, the Democrats had in the United States. We used to console ourselves, I'll let you go in a second, uh, in the George H.W. Bush White House, uh, that some political science at the time at least suggested that the recovery, people had made their judgments though in the summer kind of of the election year. That it was hard. We had, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 
the, and there was a recession in 91, sort of SNL, I think, and, and regional mostly, but, but real, a little housing, a little SNL. And, um, but I think 92 numbers ended up, 92 ended up having three and a half percent, you know, real growth, something like that. Pretty good, actually, above trend. And of course, but we told ourselves, well, we got no credit for it because it, it was mostly the last two quarters and that people don't really factor that into their voting. I don't know if that's true, still true, or the political scientists now think. Yeah. Oh, oh, I think, yeah, I think the thing that fits is like, almost like the 12 months through April. So, I mean, I can't remember. It's not right, the 12 months like through that. the election, but it's 12 months through the election. And by the way, you know, the, the GDP number, you would remember this much better than I would, that came out right before the election in 1992, was relatively weak and disappointing. Yeah. It just was subsequently revised up quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so the economy was doing quite well. You just wouldn't have known it from the data uh, that came out right before the election. And Final this is thing. Probably not biased statisticians. They do the best job they can. Numbers get yeah. revised. It is a little unnerving how much they get revised, I've got to say, as a layman. And, and sort of people are like hanging on this GDP number. And then incidentally, we just revised it. And it sounds like not that much if it's revised from, you know, 1.2 to 2.4 or something. It's like only a point. Of course, it's also a doubling, you know. It's like, yep, exactly. Um, final, internationally, anything that you sort of look around the world and think, you know, what is what if, is China really going to go into bad shape? Europe slow, or is it all kind of not decisive one way or the other? Kind of. I think everyone else is facing, roughly speaking, bigger challenges than we are here in the United States. Europe has both slower growth and higher inflation, which is a really bad combination because there's no obvious remedy. Um, China's growth really does face these challenges. They have low inflation, so I think they have a lot of remedies. They're just not choosing to use them. If you know, you put me in charge of China's economy, I think it would do better than the current leadership. But you know, and I wouldn't say that about Europe, where I have no idea. Uh, you know, I have no idea what to do um, in terms of what all that means for the United States. I don't think, frankly, it means a whole lot. First of all, we still do have some inflationary pressures, so weakness in the rest of the world does cause lower commodity prices. That helps at the pump. That helps elsewhere with our inflationary pressures. So, I think the short run weakness might be, you know, as much positive as negative um, for the U.S. economy. I don't think that's where our peril is. But yeah, I think there's policymakers around the world that, you know, wish they had the problems we had here in the United States. And it is empirically true. Is it? I mean, if you step back and go to back to the beginning of twenty one, if you want, or late nineteen, pre pandemic. You were better off having been in the U.S. than in most most of the developed countries. I mean, as yeah. a wage earner or as an investor, I think. Yeah, and some of that is things like the oil price shock. Um, the United States oil prices went up just as much as they went elsewhere in the world, but we have an oil industry here, and that does create jobs and benefit. Um, and then things like natural gas prices never went up here nearly as much as they did elsewhere. So. Um, Europe, in some sense, is what economists call a terms of trade shock. They're actually genuinely poorer because of what's happened to global commodity prices. The United States is a consumer of those commodities, but also a producer of them. So we're not, as a country, poorer in the same way that Europe is because of uh, th these commodity price increases. Interesting. But Americans don't look around and think, hey, we're doing a little better than Europe or even considerably better. And let's be happy about it, right? They, they look at... Yeah, and I, don't, I don't blame people for not doing that. But yes, I, I think if you're trying to understand the US economy, um, looking at the rest of the world does make you feel a little bit better about how we've responded to everything. Yeah, well, that's that's encouraging, though, as a matter of you can have pretty dysfunctional politics and still have a pretty decent economy. Maybe that's a good a good thing. It's not quite the Kennedy School message, I don't think, but that's okay, which is where you're sitting, if I'm not mistaken, in your office yep. there. But but that's okay, you know. Um, anything we haven't discussed, Jason, that we should cover or that we should uh, you should let people know about or they should think I'm about? I'm sure we'll until, think until of Until we talk again in six or seven I months. To say, I was about to say, I'm sure we'll think of something so we can cover it the next time. Yeah, but it, it's very interesting. This is really a, a thank you for taking the time. And it's just so interesting to think about the connection between, quote, the real economy and people's perceptions. And I think, unlike many, some of your e colleagues in economics, a friend of mine used this term the other day. Maybe this term is out there. I'd never heard of it before. Uh, like mansplaining, econsplaining, that, you know, economists get on TV and explain to those foolish uh, citizens that it's not, you may think you're this, you're paying more, you may think it's a real problem, but, and you may think this and that, but let me explain to you as an economist, you shouldn't be concerned. And I give you a lot of credit for not doing that. So. <laughs> well, thank you. 
Is that a term actually, econ planning, or did someone my friend invent like it? I feel like I've heard that, but yeah. I'm not now sure whether I'm imagining that I heard that or I'll that. Have to I look did. around. I have to look around for that. Jason Furman, thanks a lot for taking the time to be, to be with us on conversations. Thanks for having me, and thank you all for listening.